Well, thank you, Augustine. It's uh, a great honor to be uh, giving this lecture here today and to return to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base where, as you know, there's a substantial effort on metamaterials and some of the things I'm going to talk about today. Um, why do we want to see inside the wavelength? Um, as you're probably aware, the uh, ordinary optics can resolve things only at the same size as the order of the wavelength of light. So, for example, if you take a, a CD music a compact disc, then uh, you can get 600 megabytes of data on it. And that's because it's written with an infrared beam, which can only write rather big dots on the disc. And so you can pack only 600 megabytes of data. If you want to go to uh, a higher density disc, then you go to, say, a Blu-ray disc, in which you can get uh, thousands of megabytes on the disk simply because the wavelength of blue light is shorter than the wavelength of infrared light. And this is frustrating all manner of things that you really like to do with light. Uh, uh, light is the most direct way of conveying information uh, to our eyes uh, uh, from a physical system. When the microscope and the telescope were invented, science evolved in leaps and bounds. But with a microscope, you can't see the details of uh, biological cells, for example, many of which are just beyond the resolving power of, of a microscope. If you want to do integrated optics, to put optics on a chip, if the chip has to have the same density uh, as uh, an electronics chip, you're really in trouble because a line width in electronics chips is the order of 20 nanometers these days and the wavelength of light is more than 200 nanometers so you, you're an order of magnitude off in size so uh, increasingly we're wanting to control light on a hugely sub wavelength scale um, and so we have to abandon much of conventional optics and um, and strike out in new directions and that's what people are doing and some of that activity I want to talk about today. Um, so focusing light has been going on for a very long time. This is Galileo um, and he made lenses. Uh, he didn't invent the telescope but he made lenses for his telescope that were more perfect than any that had gone before. Um, by the way I'm not sure if everybody knows um, why a lens is called a lens. Uh, if you can just make it out here, this is a lentil, which is a s sort of bean, and you can see that it is lenticular in shape. So that's, that's where the name comes from. I didn't know that until I started giving lectures on it. Um, but what Galileo didn't know at the time was that um, even his telescopes, even if you made the lenses perfectly as you can. With this design of focusing, there are things which you just can't see because of the wavelength of light. And if, if you want to go into mathematical details, then you look at the wave theory of light to tell you that, but we won't go into that today. Um, well, we will actually, yes. So um, this is uh, a conventional lens, and you probably know that the uh, ability of your camera to resolve details of an image is limited by the aperture of the camera, the, the angles which it will accept. And so um, if, if you look at the wave vector of light, that's divided into two components. One is this component here, which is the magnitude of the wave vector time projected onto the axis here, and that's the bit of the wave vector that carries you from object to image. So that transports the light through the system. But then there's the transverse bit here, which is K0 sine theta, and that's what gives you the resolving power. So that's the wavelength in the plane of the object. And you can see that, of course, as you increase this angle, although you increase the resolving power, you reduce the uh, size of the wave vector which is transporting you from object to image. And when cos theta is zero at 90 degrees, you stop transporting. But that only gives you a finite wave vector. And from Fourier analysis, you get this finite resolving power here 
of the wavelength. So you're stuck, uh, except you don't have to be because some years ago, a man called Vesselago, um, in 1968, I think, um, investigated a weird concept called negative refraction. And he was talking about refraction in which instead of light emerging on this side of the normal, when it goes into a refractive medium, makes this chevron shape at the surface. And he evaluated all sorts of uh, consequences of that. And one of the consequences was that because you're bending light back on itself, it will come to a focus again inside the medium. And in fact, there are two foci, one inside, and then if the medium's thick enough, there'll be a second focus here. And this is called the Vesselago lens, and it attracted a great deal of attention in 1968. But the, atten the attention waned, and the reason was that you cannot find materials with this uh, negative refracting power in nature. Uh, and he, he did a lot of investigations of all sorts of ferromagnetic materials and so on, but he, he wasn't able to discover anything that could do this. And therefore, the whole enterprise fell apart until uh, metamaterials came on the scene in about 1999. As Augustine has said, they weren't called metamaterials then, but uh, that's when the concept arose. And uh, pretty soon after that, um, at San Diego, David Smith and his colleagues uh, made a sample according to the design of the metamaterials. Metamaterials enable you to achieve material properties which aren't available by other means. And he was able to show that negative refraction existed. Um, that caused a great deal of fuss at the time. Um, but the Vestlago lens, I realized in 2000, was also to prove to have another very strange and interesting property. Uh, and it is that it, its, its resolution isn't limited by the wavelength of light. And in order for that not to be the case, it has to have some pretty weird properties. So uh, first of all, I should explain that um, if, if you shine light on an object, the electric fields near that object uh, have details on all levels. It's not just the, the, the resolution of light <laughs> is not because there aren't any details, electromagnetic details at the object that that's on the scale of sub-wavelength. It's that they just don't escape. So that light scattered from the surface has two components. One's called the far field, which uh, is, is, is what we use in an ordinary lens and escapes easily from the surface. That's why it's called the far field. We can capture that far field and focus it with the lens, but it doesn't contain all the information about the object, and that's why the resolution is limited. But also, there's something called the near field, which decays very rapidly as you move away from the object, which is why it's called the near field. And that contains the missing information. And if you want to make a perfect image, then not only have you got to show, show that this far field can come to a focus, which I don't show here, but also somehow you've got to get hold of this near field, which is dying away very rapidly, grab hold of it, amplify it, and restore it to the same amplitude that it had at the object. Now you may think that's a tall order, and I guess it is, because normally you think of an amplifier as something with a battery in it that introduces power. Um, but there are other sorts of amplifiers that don't need power, that grab the power from the signal. And an example of this will be uh, in acoustics will be a wine glass. I'm sure you've all heard of, but most of you have never seen the experiment done of a, a singer <laughs> singing of a very fine wine glass. And when she hits the resonance, it has to be a she because generally the note's high enough uh, that a band can't sing it. When she hits the resonance of the wine glass, uh, the wine glass will ring. And if she sings loud enough and the glass is perfect enough with very little loss, then I believe you can smash that glass. I've never seen it done. If anybody's got a YouTube video of that happening, I'd love to see it because I, I could show it now. But anyways, um, 
And that's an example of a system which it has no battery in it, so where does the energy come from to smash the glass? It comes from the singer, because a resonance builds up slowly with time, gathers the energy from the singer and piles it into this one resonance and which grows with time until something catastrophic happens. Um, and it's the same with the concept of this amplifier here. So you can make an amplifier with a resonant system. And this little tail of intensity here can sort of tickle this resonance here, which over time can grow to a very large amplitude. Now, it so happens by some magic of mathematics, which I didn't believe when I first saw it, that if you have a slab of negatively refracting material here, and it has to have a negative refractive index of exactly minus one, exactly. Uh, if you don't, the resonance is off tune and it doesn't work quite so well. Then this material has exactly the right resonances in it to capture these evanescent waves and restore them. And so if you can build a piece of negative refracting material with exactly the right um, uh, resonant properties, then you can make, in principle, a lens which has uh, a perfect focus. Uh, and that statement caused a lot of consternation at the time, and quite a lot of heartache for me as people attacked the paper. <laughs> but uh, over time, uh, people have gradually accepted that, uh, that that is correct. The statement is correct, that if you built this according to recipe, you would get perfect resolution. Now, in the same paper, I suggested that an approximation to the perfect lens would be a slab of silver, perfectly flat slab of silver. That may seem a little strange, but silver does contain resonances in the form of surface plasmons, which uh, do quite a good job of grabbing this near field and bring it to a focus. And the first group to take me up on that was uh, Zhang, there should be a G there, Zhang Zhang's group at UCB, in particular Nicholas Fang, who has a further role in the story. And so what they're doing here is, if we take the Vesselago lens, which is a vacuum or a dielectric, a slab of negative refraction, and then a focus here, then what they're having is a slab of dielectric, which is, happens to be PMMA, uh, a slab of silver of equal thickness, and then the focus, uh, this should focus what's ever on this side of the PMA into the photoresist. And of course, you can't see the focus because it's sub-wavelength, so you have to write it in, in, uh, in, in the photoresist, develop the photoresist, and then look at it with an atomic force microscope. So what they've got here is uh, light with a wavelength of 365 nanometers, uh, a chromium film, uh, 50 nanometers thick, which has been written with a 60 nanometer grating and the word nano. And this system here, which is uh, 40 plus 35 centifive nanometers thick, should, if the theory is right, focus into this uh, photoresist here. And you can see that uh, the photoresist, um, when developed, shows an image of the grating, and so you've achieved lambda by six uh, re resolution. Um, in fact, it's a little more impressive to the eye to see it this way. This is a, a, a focused ion beam picture of the uh, chromium object. Um, this is what you see if there's uh, only dielectric there and no silver. So you can see it's blurred and the scan across the line width indeed shows that the line width is the order of the wavelength, 365 nanometers more or less. Um, but you put the silver lens in, in place and it's like putting your specs on and the line width goes down by a factor of six to 89 uh, nanometers. So that was confirmation that uh, resonances can grab the image and that they can focus the, the near field details. Um, but you might ask, uh, if your lens is perfect, why only 89 nanometers? Why not one nanometer? And there are some things standing in the way of that happening. Um, I think the chief one 
is surface roughness. So obviously if the surface is um, rough, it's not going to act as such a good lens. Uh, of course, if you have a rough mi mirror, then you can't see in it properly. But because we're seeing very small things, uh, and things which are sensitive to a resonance, which is easily disturbed, the slightest amount of roughness on the silver will spoil this process. So you have to get the surface flatter than one nanometer and preferably better than that. And the other thing that happens is that although silver is a very good conductor and has resonances with a very high Q, which means the, the, the losses are low, it, it nevertheless does have losses and losses spoil the resonance. And so a resonance which is supposed to amplify by so much, if you've got losses in it, it doesn't amplify by enough. And it turns out that um, the higher the resolution, the higher Q of the resonance you need, and, and so losses limit the resolution rather than aperture of the lens in this case. And, but surface roughness is also an issue. So there's been a big campaign to try and get silver films flatter than they are. Now, if you, um, if you try to, there's some material science here, because if, if you try to grow a metallic film on a dielectric, uh, it's, it's a really difficult thing to do. Ordinarily, if you grow, um, say, a semiconductor or something like that, you put a layer of semiconductor down, and then you heat it a little bit, and you anneal it so the atoms all rush around, and get into the places where they should be. Metal doesn't do that. Ha have you ever broken a thermometer with a mercury uh, center on, on the table? Uh, wh when I was a kid, we were allowed to play with whole uh, jars of mercury. Um, <laughs> that's not allowed now. They say you go mad as a hatter, don't you? <laughs> Use mercury in their work. But if, if, you, if you've ever done that, you know that if you throw mercury on a surface, it balls up. It goes into these tiny little balls, like, like putting water on a very oily surface. And as with the water, so with the mercury, it's the surface tension that drives it. Metals have huge surface tension, and therefore they just do not want to, met, to wet uh, a dielectric substrate. And so they, they don't stick, and if you try to anneal them, uh, even where they have stuck, they'll all rush together and form little balls on the surface. And that's not what you want at all. And so what you really want to do is to uh, fix that surface tension issue. And the way uh, that, that, that is done, uh, this is, is work by uh, um, Chaturvedi, uh, working in Nick Fang's group. Nick is now at MIT. And he had the uh, uh, realized that the surface tension was a problem, and what you need is a surfactant. So if you want oil to spread on water, what do you do? You put soap in the water, okay? And then the oil spreads because you fix the difference in surface tension between the two inter between, uh, the interface, and the, the water now wants to spread, uh, the oil wants to spread over the surface of the water. So if you can find something which fixes the surface tension discre discrepancy between metal and dielectric, then you're in good shape. And germanium, it turns out, a thin layer of germanium will do that. So by making a silver layer which um, ha has been put down under uh, uh, conditions where germanium is present, Nick was able to get a much, much uh, smoother super lens, and now he can uh, resolve uh, gratings with uh, a separation of lambda by 12. So it's actually double the resolution of the lens by smoothing the surface. But still, there remains the loss in the, um, I I in the silver, which will be the ultimate limit. Now, what people are doing about that, um, well, this, okay, let me explain what this is. This is something called the fishnet structure which consists of a dielectric silver layer. And its properties are due to the exact way that the, you've cut these holes in the structure. So it's a metamaterial. A metamaterial owes its properties as much to the structure as it does to the chemical composition. And it turns out that this particular holy structure here, known as the fishnet structure, has a negative refractive index. But it's still got the loss in it because the silver's there. 
So here's an electron micrograph of this uh, silver structure. And this, this is uh, a bright hope for the future of uh, getting even better super resolution uh, at optical frequencies. Um, and also, um, it's been suggested by the Shaliv group in Purdue that you can even fix the losses because this structure has holes in it and you can introduce a dye into these holes and then if you pump the dye like crazy um, you can get enough gain to compensate for the loss and the Purdue group uh, claim to have compensated for the loss in this way in this medium. Now, I have to say there's a little contro controversy about their, their uh, data but um, nevertheless this principle of amplification is being pursued very heavily. And it turns out that although dyes uh, don't give you quite as much gain as you want you, you, you're in luck because of the structure. Uh, I explained this lens works because it, it has resonances in it and resonances gather energy from the input light and make it really really powerful at a certain point and that's good because as you introduce the pump, the pump too is resonant and that instead of pumping the dye at some rate it will pump the dye at a much higher rate because you've got these very very strong resonances gathering the energy of the laser and bringing it to the point where it's needed to to put the gain into the medium. So that's a very promising approach to making the perfect lens uh, even more perfect than people have been able to make it so far. Um, but uh, what I want to go on to talk about is, is a more modest ambition which, which is, is not lensing but something I call harvesting. So what do I mean by that? So you all know what a lens is. It gathers uh, beams of light from points of the object and it brings them to a focus at the corresponding points in the image. We all know what a lens does. But what a l l light harvester does, it concentrates all the beams of light that it receives and harvests them to a single point. Why might you want to do that? Well, um, if you can make very intense concentrations of light, then you can force one photon to influence how another photon behaves. Photons don't normally interact with one another, so I can flash this laser beam around the room and it doesn't matter that it's crossing the light coming from these uh, lamps up above me. The photons just ignore one another. And you have to have very, very intense concentration of light before light can switch light, as it were. And these harvesting structures, if they can make sufficiently intense concentrations, it means that you can get photons to interact not by having these extremely powerful and costly lasers, but perhaps by having a relatively modest laser, but concentrating its powers very, in a very extreme manner. Another thing you can do is that if you can, um, if, if you're trying to detect a molecule, for example, suppose you're doing a medical essay, you want to find if a person has a certain uh, uh, chemical in the body that's causing some problem, um, then you want a very sensitive test of whether that molecule is present. And if it is again the problem of the wavelength of light, that you can focus the light down, you can't focus it into better than a cubic wavelength. Uh, but the molecule, uh, the, the cubic wave, the wavelength is about half a micron on its side. Um, but a molecule is uh, three orders of magnitude smaller than that, typically. So it's a conversation between an elephant and a mouse. Now if you could focus the light down to something which is more like the size of the molecule, then you could have much, much greater sensitivity. And ideally, you could in principle get single molecule sensitivity out of such systems. Uh, you can also think about enhancing the efficiency of uh, solar cells. Um, what I have in mind here is that um, you're, you're all familiar with the fact that uh, um, plants gather their energy from the sun and they turn the sun's energy into molecular energy in the form of sugars. And that uh, 
principle of uh, photosynthesis works through a light harvesting system. So the chlorophyll system has uh, molecules which are essentially antennae, and these molecules gather uh, the energy of, of, of the sun over a large volume, and then that energy is cascaded down from one molecule to another, not in a radiative way, but by coupling through this uh, near field I mentioned to you. It's called the Furster mechanism, the guy who first identified it. And gradually the energy accumulates at the center where the chemistry takes place, which is on a much, much finer scale than the wavelength, of course, but the energy is concentrated there and does a very efficient job <coughs> of producing sugar. So, that's one thing. And also you might want to improve the efficiency of a laser if you want to, if you really do want to imagine that you can put light on a chip and operate it on the nanoscale, you don't want a damn big laser like this thing, you want something really, really tiny, but where, in which the light is extremely concentrated on the same scale of the chip. So if you can uh, use this, this um, concentrated density of states which are produced in the harvesting system to, as a laser, then you can make uh, nanoscopic um, sources of light. So um, here's a graphic of uh, what might happen. So if you have some plasmonic system, which I'll describe in a moment, and uh, you can generate resonances in these systems, I'll explain how to do that, which um, are uh, located at the touching points of these uh, cylinders or spheres, then you might imagine sending in two beams of light which are harvested to this system here. The very high intensity makes the long linear material very, very effective because you're hyping up the energy and these two photons can then interact and exchange energy between themselves and produce the sum and difference uh, uh, products uh, uh, as well. Um, but to do that, you, you do need this, this harvesting process here. So all kinds of good things can happen if we can achieve this harvesting. So how are we going to do that? Um, so um, what, um, what I should explain, the uh, concept here which I need to explain before I start telling you what I'm going to do. Um, it turns out that if if, if you take a system which has a given shape, a given geometry, and you don't like that shape, but you do like the spectral properties. So suppose you want a system that absorbs light over a broad range of frequencies. And in the last slide, you have an example of that. Because if this thing is going to work, you want this resonance to couple to two different frequencies here and two further uh, frequencies here, so it's got to be broadband for this to be an interesting system. Operate over many frequencies, so it's a bit contradictory, isn't it? A broadband resonance, but I'll show you how to do it. So you might have a system that has a given set of spectral properties that's broadband, for example, and that will absorb light from some source or other, but you may not like its shape. Uh, and then there's a, a technique called transformation optics which uh, tells you that, okay, you don't like the shape, you can change the shape, and then uh, from that transformation of the shape, you can deduce what values of eps new values of epsilon and mu you must build this new system out of so that it inherits exactly the same spectral properties of the mother system. And that's what transformation optics is about. Now, there's a particular set of transformations in two dimensions, which are called conformal transformation. And all that means is that when you distort the system, you may change its orientation and size, but you don't change its shape. So squares go to squares, circles go to circles. Um, and under those conditions, um, the material parameters don't change at all. So if you have a system built of silver and you distort it in this conformal way, it's still made of silver and it still has the same spectral properties. And that's really neat because we don't want to go inventing new materials at optical frequencies. It was hard enough to find silver. So, okay, so this is, this is what we do. We find a mother system that has this broadband property uh, and 
ideally you'd like it to be a sufficiently simple system that you can analyze it just, just by doing the maths analytically. You don't need a computer. Uh, but it may be the wrong shape. And then you make a transformation to the desired geometry. Um, if you make a conformal transformation, then uh, you don't change the materials you need to build it from. And we use transformation optics to calculate the properties of the transform system. But we know already that the daughter system inherits the mother's analytical solution. And all you have to do is substitute the new coordinates in there. You can find all the new properties. So now, from one mother system, you can generate a whole family of structures um, containing the same DNA, the same genes, uh, but of wildly different shapes and sizes. And I'll show you how to do that. So let's see a bit of this in action. Um, this um, is uh, uh, a slab of silver. And uh, 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 silver is a material which has excitations on its surface called surface plasmons. And it turns out that if you take a slab of silver, these surface plasmons uh, have a, a dispersion relationship of wave vector along this direction versus frequency, which is broadband. And it goes right from zero frequency up to the surface plasmon frequency, which for silver is in the visible. So that has a nice broadband property. Um, and we can calculate all its properties analytically. So it's just a solve system. And you can, that's the system I've started from here of uh, a system uh, of a slab that has a broadband continuous spectrum. Um, you can invert this system. So instead of having a slab of silver, you have a slab of vacuum embedded in silver. And that also has a broadband continuous spectrum. Um, and then uh, all these can be solved with the same, I mean, they look very similar, but they give different spectra. And this guy here has a periodic array of dipoles exciting it. So you, this, this system has a discrete spectrum. Uh, you make the system periodic in this direction. That has a continuous spectrum. And uh, I forget what this one does, but I'll tell you in a moment. Um, so you, you see that the, 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 quite a broad range of properties you can get from uh, essentially very, very similar geometry. And I'm going to work on those and get to the system that I want to have. So what's this transformation thing? Well, let me uh, start with a simple example. So I start with the very simplest thing, which is a flat, semi-infinite slab of silver. And I do a transformation which maps so I can write the coordinates in complex arithmetic notation of z equals x plus i y. And then I can do an inversion, which takes points at infinity to the origin, points at the origin to infinity, and everything in between is turned inside out. So at the infinity, we have silver. So at the origin, we have silver. The closest thing to the origin is a bit of silver. So the furthest thing away from the origin is a far bit of the silver. And in between, it turns out that you have a cylinder. So this is a semi-infinite slab. You invert about this point, and you get a cylinder. And if you've worked in surface plasmonics and wondered why the spectrum of excitation of a cylinder is identical to the surface of flat silver, this is why, because one is the daughter of the other. And they both have a single band of surface plasmons, all at the same frequency. Very boring, but a nice illustration of the principle of the transformation optics. So let's go on to something that's more interesting. <coughs> so um, what about, sorry, I'm going to have to take some water. What about the case of exciting that system? So now I introduce a dipole outside the surface. And that dipole is going to give some of its energy to this uh, surface excitation here. Um, so what happens to the dipole under inversion? Well, if I invert about the center of the dipole, 
And think, think of a dipole as two very big charges very close together, plus and minus, okay? Now, if I do an inversion which sends points near the origin to points near the infinity, those two charges in this system appear to be way at infinity here. And two charges at infinity produce a uniform electric field at the origin. So this system, excited by a dipole, consisting of a semi-infinite slab of silver is equivalent to a, a cylinder of silver excited by a uniform field which might be an incident plane wave. Now it might be these two charges at infinity but it might also be an incident plane wave. So you can see the power of the method that we can get to systems which uh, are very different from the original system but that's still not a useful system. So let's go on further and now I invert about the center of the dipole, so I get a uniform field. I now uh, look at this system here, and planes go into cylinders, and you can very easily see that there's a, there's a big cylinder from this surface, and a big cylinder, from, a small cylinder from this surface, they're inside one another, and between them you have silver. So in this case, the dipole is exciting, exciting a wave at the origin, these are the surface waves, surface plasmons, and the energy goes to infinity. I don't want to do that, and that's why I've done this inversion. Of course, I want to grab the energy of an incident plane wave, and I want to send it to the origin. Good, so the inversion maps the infinity to the origin, and so these waves which are excited at the big bit of the cylinder now by an incident plane wave, so this acts like a dipole antenna, and the waves generated go around the crescent and accumulate here at the origin and the spectral properties are broadband. So you can do this trick over a wide range of frequencies, as I'll show you. Um, okay, you can also uh, do the same thing on this other structure where you have, instead of a slab of silver, a slab of vacuum surrounded by silver, and that gives you uh, uh, this structure here where now the cylinders are outside one another and they, they kiss at this point. And again, you get a dipole antenna here, and the energy is harvested to this point where they kiss. Um, okay. Um, so, do they enhance um, intensity? Yes, here's a, a, a plot of our analytic solutions mapped onto the new systems. Uh, easiest to see here. So you can see the intensity of these electric fields getting stronger and stronger as you go to this point here. And what's happening is that although in the original system these waves that the dipole excites go off with constant velocity, of course you've now shrunk these lengths to much smaller. The waves as they go to the origin here are going slower and slower. But also they're carrying the same flow of power so if they go slower, the energy density has to rise, and they, they arrive here with zero velocity. So if there are no losses in the system, the energy, as you went slower and slower, would pile up, just like the density of cars getting greater on the motorway, the same mass of cars is being transported, okay, but as they go slower and slower, they get closer together. The density of cars must increase. So. Um, uh, the density of energy increases here and can reach enormous values which you can't see on this plot. So I think on the next plot I have, okay. So I've taken the crescent and what I'm doing is plotting the electric field in the x direction as a function of angle around here. This is zero and this is 180 degrees. And as the wave goes round to this point here, the wavelength gets shorter because you're compressing the distance, so the wave goes slower, it has a, a shorter wavelength, and the amplitude here is proportional, uh, inversely proportional to the compression of the wavelength. So as the wavelength is compressed, so is the amplitude increased. And that goes on to a point here when it all appears to collapse. What's going on there? Well, this energy is, is being compacted, it's getting very dense, and it's going slowly through a system. Now if that system has losses in it, and silver does have losses, the slower energy is transported through the system, the more vulnerable it is to being eaten up as a, as a heat loss. 
And at this point, the, the process of compression is overtaken by the process of increased losses and the process collapses after that. But look at the fields. You've got to a point, and these are realistic values of uh, the um, permittivity of silver taken from Johnson and Christie. You've compressed the fields to more than a thousand times stronger than the incident field. So if you were doing, for example, uh, a Raman scattering experiment from this, which uh, is uh, proportional to the fourth power of the field enhancement, then uh, compared with uh, a Raman molecule in, in vacuum or in solution, you will get a thousand to the fourth power, 10 to the 12th more intensity from this system than you would from a molecule floating in solution. And that is something which can drive you towards single molecule sensitivity. Um, so what else? Yes, well, I'll take you through the zoo now, okay? We're gonna go through the zoo. So here is um, a situation in which you have a periodic array in this direction of uh, silver cavity, silver cavity, and the dipoles are place, placed periodically this time. Um, okay, so this system has a continuous spectrum and you can map it into a wedge by this transformation here. So what this transformation does is effectively it calls this direction the log of a radius because if you take the log, log z is equal to, log z prime is equal to z. This direction is a radius and this direction is an angle. So as we go around in angle, we go silver, vacuum, 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 silver, vacuum, 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 silver. And as we go around here, we go silver, vacuum, 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 silver. And it's periodic in angle, just as this is periodic in y and it's um, unchanged in this direction here along the z-axis is now the log of the radius. Now it turns out that this system is uh, very interesting. It inherits the spectral properties of this guy here, but now the enhancement of the fields here, although we get the same dropping off property here before, before the amplitude goes to zero, as this wave approaches this edge here, the amplitude actually goes to infinity. The energy density doesn't go to infinity, but the local amplitude near here uh, rises to infinity before you reach that knife edge point. So I think you can see a pattern emerging here. Whenever you get something which isn't continuous, like a sharp edge like this, where you go, uh-uh, or where two spheres touch one another or where you have a sharp a cusp as you do in a crescent. Whenever you have a singularity in the structure, with that singularity is, is, is usually associated the harvesting point. And that's why the original Raman resonance experiments done on rough silver surfaces, giant Raman resonances, saw such huge enhancements. Of course, those surfaces are full <coughs> of singularities. Uh, another animal in the zoo. Um, okay, so we take this structure and in this case we made this simple exponentiation transformation and here we do a slightly fancier transformation. And believe me, trust me, uh, this structure, depending on the ratio of the thickness of vacuum and thickness of silver can go into uh, two cylinders, one embedded in the other, or in the extreme case of this cylinder with infinite radius, a cylinder embedded in a, a semi-infinite surface, or with a different ratio, you can have uh, a cylinder with a, something, a bite taken out of it, or an indentation in a flat surface. So uh, again, adding to the, the zoo, which you can extract from here. And this is work by my student Yu Liu, who has also plotted the Raman signal enhancement. And what he's showing here is that here is the frequency, and here is the um, uh, angle here around from, so zero degrees is this point, and um, Sorry, what am I talking about here? This is, uh, uh, excuse me. Yep, 
Yes, okay. So he's plotting round in angle here from, from this point here to here. And as you go towards 180 degrees where these things touch, uh, you can see that you get this very, very strong enhancement. And what's more, the enhancement you see is, is broadband. It goes over a very, very wide range of frequencies. This is uh, from the far infrared into the visible. And the enhancement uh, changes a little bit in exact details according to uh, the, the geometry which you have. But, but nevertheless, you can see this, this broadband enhancement. Now, another member of that family is where you take the periodic dipoles in this direction here. And uh, now, if you make this periodic and do this transformation, you can get two cylinders again, as we had before. But now the cylinders don't touch. And what you see in this case is not a continuous spectrum, but the, uh, a single cylinder has a bunch of resonances all at the same frequency. And as you bring the cylinders together, the resonances interact with one another, hybridize, and spread out until eventually, as the cylinders touch, they come to a continuum. So what we're doing here is, as a function of frequency, we're looking at the uh, enhancement of the field at this point between the cylinders. And this is a separation uh, uh, between the cylinders as a, as, a, as a ratio to the diameter of the cylinders. So here, they're separated by a diameter. And you pretty well get the single resonance of the isolated cylinder. As you bring them closer, when they're a tenth of the uh, diameter away, you begin to see these resonances peeling off and headed down to here to uh, zero. And in the limit of the spheres, the cylinders, sorry, touching, you get this uh, continuum here and a broadband spectrum here. Something else you can do is to say, well, <coughs> what I'd really like is not cylinders. They can be a bit difficult to engineer to touch. Uh, it's probably more feasible to look at the cylinder resting on a surface, which is a, a, an extreme case. But we can also treat this case here of the touching spheres. Now, that theor this theory is exact in the electrostatic limit. This theory is an approximation. But uh, one of our postdocs, um, Antonio Dominguez has, has shown that the, the same theory can be used with a very good approximation. So um, what, what he's shown is that if you have two kissing spheres, you get a very, very similar enhancement here as you go around in angle to the kissing point, um, then the electric field is enhanced. But th there is a difference between the spheres and the cylinders. Uh, is the difference of the, the magnitude of the enhancement. So for the cylinders, the electric field is typically enhanced by a factor of 1,000. Here, it's enhanced by the order of 10,000. Why? Why is this so much greater for the cylinders? And it's not hard to see that in the case of a cylinder, you're squashing energy into in one dimension. So you're squashing it just down in this direction, pushing it into that crack that's eventually going to come to the point where the two cylinders kiss. If you have two spheres which are touching, you're squashing it in this direction, but you're also squashing it this way as well. So you've got two compression forces acting, pushing the power not to a line, but pushing it into a point. And of course, the power becomes much more concentrated then, and you, you get this very, very high enhancement factor. So if, if you believe this number, and uh, I don't, for reasons I explain. Uh, you could get a Raman enhancement of 10 to the 20th out of this, but don't believe that number because other forces will intervene. So in this spherical geometry, you can actually get to um, the, um, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got this thing upside down. This doing the transformation in the wrong direction. OK, you can actually find some experiments here. So these are experiments done at Duke University, uh, the electromagnetics by David Smith and his team, and the chemistry by Ryan Hill's team. And the problem is with these experiments that you say, well, you know, you, you, you have to do a well-characterized experiment, 
and you have to know how far a sphere is from the surface. Uh, that's hard to do. But the problem is solved by taking these organic molecules which can produce a monomer layer or bilayer or trilayer of, of known thickness from the molecular diameter. And then in, embedded in this molecular film you have Raman active molecules. So the contact point looks a little bit like this. Here's the gold sphere, uh, magnified many times, and here's the gold film. And so you shine light on this guy and you look at the Raman signal as you uh, look at um, this experiment done for very large number of layers uh, down to one uh, layer. And the data look like this. Um, so here you can see these are the discrete points you get for the separation between the gold and the, sil and, uh, gold, and the gold film. Um, which are dictated by the thickness of, of the molecular layers. So that's one, two, three, four layers. And r this gives an enhancement of the Raman signal relative to that when the spheres are very far apart of maximum in this case of two times, 2.5 times 10 to the fourth. And the uh, uh, spheres are still quite a distance apart. This is two nanometers, which is quite a long way, but you're still getting this very, very large enhancement. So does harvesting do what we want? Well, yes, we've been able to define a multi-frequency system uh, and you get the benefit of the enhancement now at all frequencies, unlike sy systems which are resonant just at one system. Uh, so, for example, we can enhance detection of a wide range of molecules with a single system, whereas existing Raman enhancing systems work only at a single frequency for which they're designed. So that's good. Uh, something else we might want to do is you want to amplify a weak signal at one frequency and you want to use a pump at another frequency and you can enhance both and get double dipping in this way. So that, that's really good. <coughs> so why am I not rich and manufacturing these all over the place uh, and the reason is that several things stand in the way. Um, the thing, the good news is, before I get into the bad news, is that uh, although many instances of the uh, perfect lens are very, very sensitive to uh, losses, this particular harvesting system is not so sensitive to losses that you, you can still get huge enhancements even with realistic values for the losses. So loss is not an issue in this case. Uh, uh, but what does get in your way is you can't make these systems very big. Because if you do, you get additional losses due to radiation and that, um, uh, 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 and that damps off all, all the effects. So you have to be able to make these systems really, really small. And that gives you really big problems of manufacturing things with sub-nanometer precision. This is very, very hard to do. And we're not quite there yet. And then there's something weird called non-locality. What is that? Well, non-locality uh, has to do with the following. Um, we're making the assumption in our calculations that if you put an electric field on the surface of a metal, then obviously there's a discontinuity of that field as you go into the metal. It's zero inside the metal, it's some finite value outside. Um, but um, that discontinuity is, is in, in fact caused by a polarization charge at the surface. And the assumption of locality is that surface charge is localized exactly at the surface, like a delta function. Now we also know from quantum mechanics that the electrons which are responsible for that polarization charge <coughs> cannot be squashed into anything less than the wavelength of an electron, which is the equivalent of the focusing limit for a lens. So you can't squash electrons smaller than the Fermi wavelength. Uh, it's known as the Fermi Thomas screening length. And that is very small. It's about 0.05 of a nanometer, but it's what's going to limit the resolution, the, the ability to concentrate light. Because if you can't make a very sharp point, because you can't cram the electrons into something which is infinitely sharp, then you cannot generate these 
um, singularities perfectly. So that's the challenge which we're investigating at the moment of non-locality. How far can we go and uh, still have a system approximated by a local one? So here are my conclusions. Um, if we can control uh, subwave, if we control subwavelength light via a resonance system, then we can build these harvesting devices, and we can do it uh, by. Uh, negative refraction, as in the vessel, Vesselago lens, or in a more limited form of system like a silver layer, uh, which approximates the Vesselago lens. Um, so, uh, what we can also do is to uh, use transformation optics once we have a working system uh, which has the right spectral properties, and we can generate a whole raft of different systems from it. There is no limit to the number of systems to which you can transform. This, this, these mother systems, they're just limited by your imagination. And from them, we can generate a whole family of devices. If one isn't convenient for your particular experiment, uh, we'll find another one for you. And the tool which we use for this is called transformation optics. And the chief limitation at the moment is manufacture of these devices to sub-nanometer scale. But once we've done this, there'll be um, very, very interesting prospects. The, the new horizons in sub-wavelength optics consist of non-linearity and persuading light to interact with light. Just like electrons can switch electrons, we want light to switch light, light to interact with light. And it's techniques like these which harvest light and gather the intensity which will enable us to do that. And a, a lot of the future of sub-wavelength light uh, lies in this direction. So thank you very much for your attention.